Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon. We are here in the matter of the state of Georgia versus Tasmia Janisha Whitehead. Ms. Whitehead is 20 years of age, having been born on November 27, 1993. Before the court is an unfiled accusation stating charges of voluntary manslaughter, falsification in government matters, possession of knife, or commission of a crime. I expect that Ms. Whitehead will be entering a guilty to all three counts of that accusation today. I would ask that the court accept that accusation and to order that the clerk of court file it upon the resolution of this hearing this afternoon. As I've indicated, Ms. Whitehead is going to enter a plea of guilty to this accusation. In that regard, the court may be aware that she would have the right to have these particular charges, that is voluntary manslaughter, falsification in government matters, and possession of a knife during the commission of a crime, presented to a Rockdale County grand jury and would have a right to grand jury indictment in these matters. Ms. Whitehead has signed a document in consultation with her attorney, which is a waiver of grand jury indictment and agreement to proceed by accusation as to those three charges. Ms. Whitehead was 16 years of age at the time that this event took place back on Wednesday, January 13, 2010. As the court is well aware, there is a co-defendant in this case, Ms. Whitehead's twin sister, Jasmia Kanisha Whitehead, and she is scheduled for trial the week of March 17. The victim in this case was the biological twin's mother. Her name was Jarmecca Yvonne Whitehead. Most of her friends and family called her Nikki. She was 34 years of age at the time of her death. She was a hairstylist by profession and was attending Bowder College in Atlanta. She was looking to become a fashion designer. She wanted to become a fashion designer to the stars. That was her goal. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking to the court about the factual basis behind these charges and the events that took place on January 13, 2010. I recognize that Your Honor was not the original judge in this case, that this case was originally signed to Chief Judge Sidney Nation, and upon his retirement, this matter was transferred to this court. And so I'd like to take an opportunity to at least fill the court in as to some of the facts and circumstances regarding this case. As I mentioned, the death of Jarmecca Yvonne Whitehead and Nikki took place on Wednesday, January 13, 2010. At the time, she lived at 2020 Appaloosa Way here in Conyers, Rockdale County, Georgia. She lived in a townhome with her then-live-in boyfriend, a gentleman by the name of Robert Head, who was employed at that time as a long-haul trucker. Law enforcement initially became involved on the afternoon of January 13, 2010 at approximately 3.25 p.m. At that point in time, the defendant before the court, that is Tasmia Whitehead, ran from the residence at Appaloosa Way, spotted a Rockdale County Sheriff's deputy who happened to be driving through the neighborhood, ran up to his vehicle and reported her mother's death. The deputy ran into the residence, and what he found was Jarmecca Whitehead deceased in the master bedroom bathtub. Later, at autopsy, it was determined that the victim died as a result of multiple stab wounds. Most of the wounds were shallow and non-life-threatening to the extent that any knife wound can be shallow or non-life-threatening, but four were significant. There were two knife wounds, one that punctured the left lung, one that punctured the right lung. There was one injury, one knife wound that punctured the internal jugular vein of Ms. Whitehead. Those three injuries and all the other shallow, non-life-threatening knife wounds were survivable. However, there was a fourth wound that struck the spinal cord in the back neck area of Ms. Whitehead. It was ultimately this wound which was the most life-threatening and would have probably resulted in her death in a matter of minutes. According to the medical examiner, she could have survived all the injuries, but only if medical personnel had been on scene and had been available to provide life-saving techniques at that point in time. At the scene, after reporting to the Rockdale County Sheriff's deputy the discovery of their mother, both girls were moved to an ambulance which had arrived at 2020 Appaloosa Way. They sat in the back of the ambulance. They were crying. They were upset. They reported that they had just come home from school at Rockdale County High School, had gotten off the bus, had come to the house, had unlocked the door, walked in. Tasmia indicated she had gone to the right towards her bedroom. 
Jasmine indicated she went to the left, ultimately saw blood, and found her mom in the bathtub. They both indicated at that point in time that they were not aware as to how their mother had died. They were quickly uh, removed from the scene and taken to the City of Connors Police Department where they were interviewed. They stated that their mother had come home the previous evening, uh, that they saw that she was obviously intoxicated, and Ms. Whitehead, who was before the court, indicated that she had to put her mother to bed. They said that they, they stayed up during the early morning hours because they heard their mother arguing on the phone with her other boyfriend at the time, a gentleman by the name of Joe Carter. Uh, Joe Carter was a barber in the barber shop next to the hair salon where Nikki Whitehead worked. Joe Carter indicates that he did speak with uh, Nikki Whitehead in the early morning hours of January the 13th and that they were arguing. He indicated that uh, uh, he was dissatisfied with the relationship that Miss Whitehead had with uh, the other boyfriend, Robert Head, and he was going to end the relationship. And that proceeded into the early morning hours. The girls said they could hear their mother talking loudly, and it was this loud tone of voice that kept them up uh, into the late hours of the morning and said it was very late by the time they went to sleep on the morning of the 13th. They said they woke up that morning and they realized they were late for school, um, had either their alarm clock had not gone off or they missed the alarm clock, that they got up, they got dressed, they knocked on their mother's bedroom door, uh, yelled that they were leaving for school, her bedroom door was locked according to them and they got no response and so they left for school. They indicated that they realized very quickly that they had missed the bus to Rockdale County High School and told law enforcement that they walked to school and arrived in time for all of their classes. And they continued to deny any knowledge as to their mother's death. At some point during this interview process, the City of Conyers Police Department noticed that both girls had scratches or injuries to their hands. They observed that both girls had what appeared to be bite marks to their lower arms and the defendant before the court, Casbia, had a cut to her right ring finger. The girls indicated that they had gotten these injuries in a, a variety of ways, either through um, biting with each other or a mishap in Robert Head's automobile or um, Ms. Whitehead, who was before the court, indicated that when she became stressed, she would bite herself. Uh, that night, the City of Congress Police Department released the girls to their great-grandmother's custody, a woman by the name of Della Frazier. Law enforcement learned from the medical examiner in this particular case that there was no apparent sexual assault to the victim. Uh, there was no forced injury to the residents of 2020 Appaloosa Way. And given the somewhat violent nature of the crime, they concluded that this was a in their minds was a crime of passion, that it wasn't a stranger on a stranger case, and so they began to look at those who were close to Nikki Whitehead. They looked at the twin girls, Jasmine and Tasmia. They looked at both boyfriends, Joe Carter. Joe Carter they found the night that Nikki Whitehead's body was discovered. So in the evening hours of January the 13th, 2010, they found Joe Carter at his barber shop. Uh, they approached him, uh, they informed him that Nikki Whitehead had passed that day, uh, and in their minds he became appropriately upset, uh, was crying, distraught, shaking. Uh, they asked him at that point in time if he would allow them to, to look at his person, that is to look at his chest, to look at his arms, to look at his hands to see if he had any observable injuries, and he agreed. He later submitted to DNA testing, and none of the DNA tested in this case came back to Joe Carter. He later submitted to a polygraph test, which he passed. Uh, they also checked his phone records and saw that, at least from looking at his phone records, uh, he was nowhere near Rockdale County in the city of Conyers at the time that Nikki Whitehead would have been killed. They also looked at Robert Head, the long haul trucker. Uh, they quickly discovered based on phone records and a GPS system which is attached to his truck that Robert Head was had left that Tuesday afternoon the day before, so January the 12th, and was on his way to take a load to Shelbyville, Indiana, 
uh, and they were able to establish that he was several states away at the time of Nikki Whitehead's death. <clears throat> City of Congress Police Department then began to try to check out the story that they had been given by the girls. Um, the story that they'd gotten up that morning, they'd missed the bus, they'd walked directly to school, and that they made made it to school and arrived on time. They were able to obtain some video footage from the Shell Station, which is located on West Avenue here in Conyers, Rockdale County. And looking at that footage, they saw at approximately 10:16 that morning what appeared to be the girls walking up Green Street on the side of the Shell Station. They observed a multicolored Dodge Avenger uh, at the Shell Station, a gentleman who looked like he belonged to that vehicle. And then they could only see shadows, but they believed that the girls had gotten into that vehicle around 10, 12, 10, 11, 10, 13 a.m. and had left um, that location. Shell Station is not, not very far from 2020 Appaloosa Way. They then were able to pull video footage from Rockdale County High School which showed the multicolored vehicle arriving at Rockdale County High School at approximately 10, 15, 10, 16. The, the girls entering the, the front entrance of Rockdale County High School and proceeding to the counselor's office. They then were able to go to the counselor's office and speak with one of the counselors who remembered the girls coming in about that time. And the counselor, in fact, remembered giving Jazz Mia a pass to class Later, the City of Connors Police Department was able to find that pass, which noted they had arrived at, at school at approximately 10, 10 that morning, according to the counselor. So the City of Connors Police Department knew at that time they had a two to three hour unexplained gap of time in relation to what the girls had both told them. The City of Connors Police Department then obtained, over the next couple of weeks, a search warrant for dental impressions from both girls, and they executed that search warrant at a local dentist's office here in Rockford County. Those impressions were taken to a uh, forensic odontologist, a forensic dentist, who had also collected dental impressions from Nikki Whitehead's remains, and she made a comparison. While most of the bite marks were not significant enough for her to make a comparison, and say that it matched any particular individual. There was one more significant bite mark to the defendant who was before the court's left arm. She, the forensic odontologist was able to review that bite mark, was able to review the dental impression for Nikki Whitehead and for Tasmia and Jasmia Whitehead, and she came to the conclusion that to a reasonable degree of probability, the bite on Tasmia Whitehead's left arm uh, was placed there by her mother. The City of Congress Police Department spent several days collecting evidence, uh, or what they might believe, or they believe might be important evidence at the 2020 Appaloosa Way residence. Uh, they submitted that evidence to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. They were able to obtain the twins' DNA. Now, I say the twins' DNA because they are biological twins. They have the same DNA, so there is no way to uh, essentially separate one from the other, but they were able to obtain the twins DNA from a broken vase, uh, a pair of boots, and a pair of tennis shoes that were found in the home that had apparent blood on them. And the DNA that was tested was DNA from blood. It wasn't DNA, say, touch DNA, or skin DNA, or semen, or saliva. It was blood DNA that they were able to discover. After obtaining the opinion from the forensic dentist, after obtaining the opinion from the GBI crime lab in May of 2010, the girls were arrested. As a way of background, and I, I think to understand this case, you have to understand background. It appears by all counts that up until about the age of 13, Nikki Whitehead, Tasmia Whitehead, and Jasmia Whitehead had a, a loving mother-daughter relationship. Um, the majority of this time, they lived with the great-grandmother of the family, that is great-grandmother to the girls, grandmother to the victim, a woman by the name of Della Frazier. The girls were smart. They made good grades. For the most part, they made straight A's. Mom was a partier, 
but mom was a hard worker and mom provided for the girls. The girls were involved in dance and ballet and modeling and they essentially wanted for nothing. And while it was a non-traditional family, it, it seemed to work up until about the age of 13. At the age of 13, or roughly that time, Nikki Whitehead moved out of her grandmother's home, the girl's great-grandmother's home, and moved in with her boyfriend, Robert Head, here in Conyers, Rockville County, Georgia. Shortly thereafter, problems began. Uh, Jarmecca, Nikki, disapproved of what she observed was the girl's growing interest and relationships with boys. She believed that they were starting to be sexually active. She disapproved of their, what was becoming a growing disrespectful demeanor towards her and later disapproved of their truancy, their dropping grades, and their marijuana usage. The girls on the flip side resented their mother's attitude towards them. They resented her restrictions involving boys and saw their mom's own promiscuity, absenteeism, and alcohol, drug, and marijuana use as hypocritical. One of the girls reported that it, at a point in time she had been raped and resented her mother's unwillingness to believe her account of those events. On the other hand, Nikki Whitehead didn't believe that the rape occurred, and that caused friction and discontent to a great extent between Nikki Whitehead and the other defendant in this case, Jasmia Whitehead. Thrown into this mix of growing discontent, was conflict between the great-grandmother, Della Frazier, and Nikki Whitehead. The great-grandmother, even after they had moved out of her home into Robert Head's town home here in Conyers, uh, still continued to be involved in the girls' lives, uh, sometimes overriding or discounting or taking away from the parental dictates that Miss Whitehead had. And she saw this as interference. She saw it as interference to her right to parent and thought that her grandmother, the great grandmother, was financially motivated in her activities. On the flip side, Ms. Frazier countered uh, that she was concerned for the girl's safety and well-being given what she perceived or believed the victim's lifestyle was. All of this came to or, or boiled to a head in June of 2008. On June 28, 2008, the City of Conyers Police Department was called to the residents here in Rockville County. They were called because the victim complained that she had been hit and she had been jumped on by the girls. When City of Conyers Police officers arrived, they found Jazz to be upset, they found Nikki to be upset, and Taz was nowhere near the residence. This is a family that thrives in chaos, and while they participate actively in therapy, all members, mom, great-grandmother, and the girls, struggled to take their own responsibility for family stress. The counselor noted that the girls had been given a disproportionate amount of responsibility, and the, and the counselor said it would also be helpful to note that the adults in the family had failed to guide these children properly. The counselor recommended that the girls be returned to their mother's care and stated that living with a great-grandmother has simply swapped one set of problems for another and has not stabilized this family. The juvenile court found the girls in violation of probation. That is, the juvenile court found that while in their grandmother's custody, they had absconded on occasion from the grandmother's custody. They found that the girls were true. The juvenile court found that they were truants, and that their grades had been dropping while in the custody of their great grandmother. And followed the recommendation of the counselor that custody be returned to Nikki Whitehead. When the court found and indicated that that important decision, there was chaos in the hallway of the juvenile court. That is, my understanding is that uh, both girls were upset. In all fairness, I've been told that Jasmia, the defendant who is not before the court, was the most upset. Uh, but they, they were upset, they were crying, there was screaming, there was chaos. It's probably it's, it's the exact word that the probation officer described to me. Jasmia was even so upset that she said in the presence of the victim and the victim's mother, Linda Whitehead, that if I have to go live with you again, I'm going to kill you. Because of that comment, 
a status conference. The, the, the uh, court attempted to intervene, tried to calm everybody down, and indicated that there would be a status conference scheduled two weeks, two weeks after the 5th. So approximately January the 19th, there would be a status conference. And the girls were uh, placed in the custody of Mickey White. During the next eight days, the drama continued. The night that the girl that custody was changed, the victim called her mother, Linda Whitehead, indicated that she was concerned about the girls and asked her mother if she would come over and spend the night. Linda Whitehead went over that night. The girls remained in their room, and there, there really was no event or confrontation that night. However, the next morning was different. When the girls woke up, and it was Nikki's, it was Miss Whitehead's plan to take the girls that day to withdraw them from Towers High School so she could enroll them in Rockdale High School. The girls were moody, they were disrespectful, and just nasty. This continued when they arrived at Towers High School, and there were school resource officers who indicated that uh, a process that normally would have taken 30 minutes took several hours because of the uh, disruption there at Towers High School. On the other hand, a couple of days later when Ms. Whitehead took the girls to Rockdale County High School to enroll them there, it was Ms. Whitehead who was asked by a counselor to step out of the room because she was so disruptive that the counselor could not finish the enrollment process. During that same eight-day period, the City of Congress Police Department was called to the Appaloosa residence twice. Uh, that Friday, so uh, one, two, three days after custody had changed, the City of Congress Police Department was called by Nikki Whitehead uh, because the defendant before the court, Casmita Whitehead, had become disrespectful, had, had thrown a bag of food uh, uh, across the table and it hit the wall and uh, she wanted the, the police department to help de-escalate tensions. The next day, it was the defendant before the court, Casmita Whitehead, who called the City of Connors Police Department. Uh, there had been a welcome home party for the girls and towards the end of that welcome home party, uh, there had been a confrontation between Jasmia Whitehead and one of her aunts, uh, which essentially was a pushing match between the two. The City of Congress Police Department arrived and uh, uh, calmed that situation down as well. However, um, by Tuesday the 12th, Based on conversations that the girls had, based on conversations that Nikki had, everything seemed to have calmed down by January the 12th. Maybe that was because Robert Head had come back into town and he had been in the home Monday the 11th and he had been in the home Tuesday the 12th, uh, but he left to deliver that load that I mentioned early, earlier uh, on the afternoon of the 12th and there, therefore was out of the household. Several months ago, the defendant before the court, that is Tasmia Whitehead, spoke with my office. And while we don't necessarily believe everything she said, uh, there are some things that have a ring of truth, and here's what she told us. She indicated that on the morning of January the 13th, 2010, she and her sister, having been up late the night before, in fact, did wake up late from school. Uh, they got up, they went to the kitchen where their mom was, and they indicated, she indicated that her mom was upset and was mad because they had gotten up late. She indicated that her mom said, y'all aren't going to do what you've been doing. You're not going to do just what you want to do. She indicated that her mom had a pot in her hand at that point in time, slung the pot towards her sister, hitting her sister, hitting, that is, the co-defendant in this case, with the pot. She then said that she reacted and took the pot away from her mom. She indicated that her mom grabbed the steak knife and that a fight began. She said that there was name calling and cursing and gouging and scratching and everybody was mad. She said that during the fight her mom was cut and stabbed. She indicated that she was bit and scratched. She indicated that at one point the fight actually stopped and her mom went out of the house, she didn't know where, uh, and returned some period of time later. Uh, we know, or we believe, we don't know, we weren't there, 
we believe that she went to the house or the town home next door because we found blood on a wall next to the front door of the residence next door at 2018 Athletes Away. And the gentleman who lives there by the name of Osbert Dolphy, and Osbert Dolphy told police that on the morning of the 13th, uh, around 10 o'clock, his time frame doesn't quite match, but around 10 o'clock he heard a, uh, he first heard his dog bark, and he heard a, a, a ringing of his doorbell uh, that he described as frantic, just ring, 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 ring banging on his front door. He said his, his first step was to calm his dog down and that by the time he got to the door he looked at the peephole and didn't see anybody. He never opened the door, he never investigated. Tasmia Whitehead told my office that her mom came back in and sat down and said everyone was tired. That the knife was on the floor and then her mother lunged for the knife. Uh, that at that point in time the fight was on again <coughs> and eventually the blows necessary to bring about the death of Nikki Whitehead took place. The defendant is entering a plea of guilty to all three counts of the indictment, voluntary manslaughter, falsification in government matters, and possession of a knife in the commission of a crime. The state's recommendation as to count one is 20 years to serve in prison. As to count two, state's recommendation is five years to serve in prison to run consecutive to count one. As to count three, the state's recommendation is five years to run consecutive to counts one and count two for a total of 30 years in prison. That is the maximum the court can award or can sentence to under these charges. At a point that the court believes it is appropriate, Linda Whitehead would like to address the court. <coughs> Right, Ms. Whitehead, would you please stand up? Would you raise your right hand the best that you can? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give the matter pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and none of the truth except you got? Yes, sir. Thank you. You may put your hand down. Are you Tasmia Denisha Whitehead? Yes, sir. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, sir. Can you read and write? Yes, sir. Do you understand the English language? Yes, sir. Do you understand what's going on here today? Yes, sir. I'm holding in front of me a plea of guilty acknowledgement of waiver of right from that question 1 through 25. And that's a signature on the back of T. Whitehead. Did you sign this document? Yes, sir. There are also the initials TW in response to questions 1 through 25. Did you place your initials there? I did, sir. All right. Do your initials indicate your answers to the question? Yes, sir. Did you have a chance to read and understand each question before you put your initials there? Yes, sir. Now, you know you don't have to sign, say, or do anything to show you're guilty of the offense of voluntary manslaughter, false statement in a governmental matter, in a government matter, and possession of a knife during the commission of a crime, unless you want to. Yes, sir. You know what you're charged with, don't you? Yes, sir. Do you understand you have a right to a jury trial? Yes, sir. Do you understand if you had that jury trial, the state of Georgia would be required to bring in witnesses to testify against you, and those witnesses would be placed under oath? Yes, sir. Do you further understand that you or your attorney, Mr. Lamont and Ms. Johnson, would have the right to question or cross-examine any of those witnesses? Yes, sir. Do you understand this court can make any witnesses you'd like to have brought into court to testify for you in your defense? Yes, sir. You're represented by Mr. Lamont and Ms. Johnson. Are you satisfied with their services? Yes, sir. Is there anything else they could have done for it that they have not done? I don't think so, sir. All right. Then understanding all the rights have been explained to you and gone over by your lawyers, do you wish to enter a guilty plea today? Yes, sir. Is your decision to plead guilty to these charges made freely and voluntarily? Yes, sir. Are you now under the influence of any drugs, medicines, or alcohol? No, sir. Do you want a trial by jury? No, sir. Has anyone made any promises or threats to cause you to enter this plea? No, sir. Has anybody used any force to make you do this? No, sir. Now you understand, don't you, if you're not a citizen of the United States of America, the entry of this plea could result in your deportation. Yes, sir. And have you been informed in writing, and is this your signature regarding the time limits necessary to file a plea for habeas corpus action? Yes, sir. All right. Now I also want to make sure you're clear about this. Did you have the chance to go over the waive of the grand jury indictment and agreement to prosecution by accusation? You heard Mr. Reed talk about that. Yes, sir. And you agree with what you signed that you agreed to waive the uh, 
arraignment on the accusation and go forward on these charges? Yes, sir. Oh. Then I find some record. Ms. White has freely and voluntarily waived the right to a jury trial, knowing that a plea, and I accept that plea, is freely and voluntarily given. Y'all may be seated. I'd be glad to hear from y'all in just a minute. Whomever you'd like to have. Okay. I'd like to make one final statement for the record. Uh, we, we showed Ms. Whitehead at the time that we interviewed her a steak knife, one of the ones that were used at, at the residence of 2020 Appaloosa Way. She indicated that was the type of knife that was used. It did have a blade of three or more inches, which meets the requirements of the statute. With that said, uh, the victim's mother, Linda Whitehead, would like to speak to the court. All right. Ms. Whitehead, you come up, please. Ms. White, yes, would you raise your right hand, please? Okay. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give the matter to before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Now, then, I'll be glad to hear whatever you'd like to share with me. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and I would like to thank the court for allowing me to speak today. Absolutely. I am Linda Whitehead. The victim is my oldest daughter, Jamaica Whitehead. Thank you. Has me is my granddaughter. Y'all, I would just like to say today, I'm a broken mother and a broken grandmother. This has been a ima unimaginable situation to be in. Um, I love my daughter. I love my granddaughter. There are no winners here today. I agree with that. Um, I. I want to ask the court not to lose sight of what my child must have went through that morning on January 13th. And I'm asking you to look at all the evidence and whatever decision you make today. I'm asking that it be a just decision and a fair decision for my child, who is not here to speak for herself and would never. <laughs> He will never be back. Hug me, talk to me, call me and say, I can't tell you the pain. <laughs> that I experience every day and every night. It's just unimaginable. I don't know if you have any kids or not. This court has children. This court has experienced tragedies as everybody else has. No one likes to lose a love. Amen. So I am no different than anybody else. <coughs> Each of us have had tragedies in our lives. I include. So, and that's part of all of our makeup. Yes, sir. I'm just asking you to be fair and understand that my child was the victim here. And whatever decision you make today, this is the decision I would have to deal with. I know my child can't come back. And um, if you do wrong in this world, there are consequences. And unfortunately, my grandchildren never learn right from wrong. They love, never learn consequences of their actions. And that's why we're here today. Well, there's no question in this court's mind that there are consequences for the conduct mm -hmm. of this young lady. Mm -hmm. There's no question about mm -hmm. that. There's no question there were consequences suffered by your child mm -hmm. at the hand of mm -hmm. this grandchild. I understand. Amen. The court's going to do what's appropriate. Amen. That's all I can tell you. Thank but I, I need you need to understand this. I don't think anybody's here without a broken heart. Right. Mm -hmm. You need to understand. I, I recognize that. Amen. Everybody in this courtroom, the state of Georgia recognizes. The defense recognizes. Everybody recognizes. Rarely are there ever winners in court. Exactly. Rarely. Right. And they're not today. Right. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But okay. I'm not in your shoes. You need mm -hmm. to understand that. I am empathetic mm -hmm. and sympathetic, but my path was different than yours. Right. And that's the way life is. Right. And, but I understand greatly that there is no there are no ones. And that quite frankly, the tragedy of that that event several years ago will last on and on and on. No, but that right. doesn't stop you from remembering your daughter in the manner that you should. Right. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lamal, I'd be glad to hear anything you'd like to share with me. Yes, very briefly. Uh, just on behalf of Ms. White, we ask that you accept her plea of guilty these charges as accused and presented to the court, and we ask that you accept 
uh, the recommendations set forth by the state that have been um, um, wrangled with and negotiated and asked to accept that. That's why I have you please stand up. I'm going to tell you this. I have read this many times. The expression, and y'all have to, tragedy of epic proportions. I never knew what that was until today. I know what that means today. There is no joy in being here today for anybody. I understand that. I made a finding that Ms. Whitehead freely and voluntarily waived her right to a jury trial, knowing that a plea, and I accepted that plea, is freely and voluntarily given. And I think this is a reasonable resolution to a great tragedy that lasted not a day, not a week, but for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, there are consequences for your conduct. You've entered a guilty plea, and you'll have to deal with those consequences. Mm -hmm. Everybody always wants to hear somebody say uh, some type of response, but words are never going to be appropriate. Amen. And the way we show remorse is how we live each day. Right. We all know where you're going to be. It's all going to be based on how you live. Count one, I sentence you to 20 years. I ordered you serve that in confinement. Count two, I sentence you to five years. I want those five years to be served in confinement. Count two, run consecutive count one. Count three, I sentence you to five years in confinement. Those five years will run consecutive to count two, which is consecutive to count one, giving you a sentence of 30 years to serve. I ordered the state of Georgia to give you credit for every day that you have been incarcerated up to this day. And I wish you the best of luck. That's um, but Nikki was um, a loving person. She was not, um, she didn't, you know, argue with people. She always brought people together. And I know she wanted the best for her kids and she tried to do the best that she could. You know, but she, she couldn't be a jealous. She couldn't, you know, she couldn't make them do the right thing. And there was nobody there to protect my child in her own house. I just wish they never had sent, sent them back home without true counseling, you know, where they were at least communicating and talking to each other, but is, it was conflict. Is there anything that you saw that you think led to uh, the changes in your daughter, I mean your granddaughters, because for all intent and purposes, when we, you know, up to the time they turned 13, they were... Fine. The problem. The problem started when they, um, the two years that they were out of the home with my mother, Della Frazier. Do you think that, or, or what do you think uh, contributed to that? In, uh, I think mother? she persuaded them not to mind their mother, and what? obviously um, they were turned against her. Why would, you, why would your grandmother, well, why would your mother do that? Because she wanted to be in control of them. Does she still survive? She was in here today. Um, was she over here? Yeah, the older lady that favored me. <laughs> I favored her. She was in here today. What is your relationship like with your mother? Uh, it's strange. Um, you know, when my daughter started going through the juvenile court system, I was supporting her, mm -hmm. and my mother was supporting the twins. And so it was just conflict, conflict, and nobody could talk to each other. And my daughter, she would go over to try to talk to my mom, and she would call the police, you know. It was just constant conflicts, and I just wish this juvenile court system would have gave them to me instead of 70 something year old woman, you did know. Did you try to get them? I did, and they would put me out the courtroom or would not let me say anything in the courtroom. This is just a horrible, horrible situation, even with the judicial system. From the juvenile system, we started here, and now look where we are today. Did you see any of the violence between them that was described? In, no, the, the, only, the only behavior I saw, because I wasn't around them the two years they were with my mom, because she would not let my daughter see them, and she would not let me see them, and I didn't want to go over there and I'd be in jail, you know, so. Um, the only time I'm, my daughter saw her kids was doing counseling, and my mother was right there with them, so counseling was just a joke, uh -huh. you know, nothing got accomplished. Yeah, well, like I, as I said before, it, it wasn't the best day, but it wasn't the worst day, 
you know, things could have been a lot worse. But I'm just happy God open a window and threw a blessing out, you know. And it's a very hard day because, as I said, those girls lived in my home most of their lives and also their mom, too.